Hello to everybody and welcome uh, to this uh, clinical interview of PCR 2021. I'm Giulio Guagliumi, interventional cardiologist from Bergamo. And uh, with us uh, we have... Uh, Tina Bilsbel, I'm a diabetologist working at Steno Diabetes Center in Copenhagen and a professor at the University of Copenhagen, also in Denmark. We have uh, critical learning objectives. We wanted to understand how intravascular imaging can assess a patient risk profile. We would like to know how referring physicians can utilize and patient can benefit from an imaging guided intervention. And finally, we learn to learn how IVUS NIAS images can be used as a tool to enhance a patient education and compliance. Let's go to the case. Today, we are going to be focused uh, on the diabetes patients of uh, type 2 and uh, how the interventional cardiologist may interact uh, with uh, uh, the uh, clinician to enhance uh, the continuous of uh, care. This is our patient, Tina. It's uh, a younger man, uh, diabetes type 2, metformin uh, daily with uh, multiple uh, risk factors, smoker, uh, high LDL cholesterol, and it was admitted uh, for an inferior STEMI. And uh, as you know, Tina, when uh, we have uh, this type of patient, uh, we do not have too much time. We need uh, to go strictly to the point, uh, treat uh, the vessel. You can see the right coronary artery was almost occluded, and then uh, fix uh, with uh, a stent. But uh, the point, Tina, is, um, uh, what about uh, the next? Uh, what about uh, the risk uh, of these uh, patients? Uh, it's not enough uh, to treat uh, these vessels, but uh, we needed to understand about uh, also the remaining vessels. And this is what we are normally doing. So we are going uh, with angel and uh, checking the lumen profile. And then we are interrogating the vessel by using intravascular ultrasound, as you might see here. So going millimeter by millimeter to understand the content. And then that is the novel of this technology. Beside the plaques, we can learn also on the components. These yellow colors means lipid rich. And we have numbers. We know how much lipid that they are, where they are located, and the level of this lipid-rich plaque. And so we are making a calculation and measurements about the risk profile of this non-calculated lesion in terms of plaque burden and in terms of plaque uh, um, lipid-rich plaque. And why we are doing this? Because uh, uh, we conducted a lot of study, many of these studies were conducted also in Denmark, plus uh, Prospect 2, where we discovered that uh, this uh, remaining potential risk of, uh, for the patient is uh, done by the combination of the content, the plaque burden, and uh, the amount of lipid, as you might see in follow-up, uh, the outcome is going to be completely different. So, Tina, you know, the questions are, uh, how do health professionals translate uh, this uh, picture uh, to the type of treatment, uh, especially when you're dealing with uh, younger patients uh, and uh, that you needed to manage in the daily practice? Well, for me, I'm, I'm always impressed when I see what cardiologists can do. It's really fancy methods that you, you use. Um, it's important for me because I, with this patient, he's almost 60 years old. You call him young, but he is 60 years old. And I know that in average, having type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease will cut off 12 years of his lifespan compared to a patient without diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And when I sit in front of a guy like that, I will have to convince him to take drugs for a disease that he can't feel, uh, drugs that might be expensive, they might have side effects, and, 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 and it is really, really a challenge. So I really see tools like this 
as as interesting because if a patient like that goes to you he it might have a stent some might have a bypass some of them think that well with the stent with the bypass they're cured so the rest of their arteries they or their heart really looks great and so for me it's a it's a really really interesting approach that you provide us with here okay Tina, in addition, different approaches may be used by the clinician to stratify the extent of a cardiovascular risk. Which additional factor define a high risk 50 years old type 2 diabetes patient? Well, there are many. Uh, we know patients are smokers often. We know that they are dyslipidemic. We know that ha they have hypertension. Diabetologists, they talk a lot about obesity and body composition, visceral fat, et cetera. So there are many factors, but my challenge in the clinic is that it's really difficult for me to visualize many of these things to have the patient really understand what the challenge is. Okay. Tina, let's go back uh, to our story. So we investigated this uh, remaining vessel and based upon uh, the multiple yellow high lipid content and the distribution and uh, the amount of plaque we decide to treat. And we treat it with the multiple stents. And here you can see the results, uh, how we are dealing in this case uh, in terms of uh, personalized medicine with uh, the spinal results uh, with a normal expansion of the stents, but also you can see the contribution of uh, the near spectroscopy with a much less lipid, but uh, some lipid that uh, we purposely left uh, not to go too far back uh, into the left main. And uh, these lipids that they are remaining are very important uh, when the, the major or this level because also in this case, what we are leaving back might have a strong impact on outcome. So we show that, uh, uh, Tina, we are treating by stents. Uh, we are assessing the plaque by using imaging in combination with uh, NEOS content uh, for doing what uh, in practice? Well, for changing the life story of this patient. And we've known for decades to use ACE inhibitors or ARBs and also statins. But a lot of things have ha actually happened within the field of diabetes the recent years, which is, of course, why the cardiologists have become interested in all the drugs that we use in type 2 diabetes. Because now we use a lot more than just statins and, and ACE inhibitors and ARBs, because we've actually started using modern glucose-lowering drugs I'm sure you know about all the cardiovascular outcome trials and in the guidelines just the recent years, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists have proven really, really to change the life story of, um, of MACE in these patients with type 2 diabetes. So they work beyond being glycocentric. It's not only about decreasing glucose. It is still important in respect to microvascular complications, eyes, kidneys, and nerves. But in respect to cardiovascular disease, they have really, really been game changers in diabetes because they work widely and often very well together in the phenotype of type 2 diabetes. Um, and it has, been, it has been a game changer. So for me, seeing a patient like this, who is only on metformin, that was the patient's inclusion here, um, is really a high risk individual. And there's nothing to say else than this guy should have a GLP-1 receptor agonist if that doesn't work because he has documented atherosclerotic disease. He should have at least an SGLT2 inhibitor to change uh, the life story. And the numbers needed to treat are actually in some of the trials even more significant than when we learned to use statins and ACE inhibitors. Super. Tina, uh, for the audience, uh, do you mind uh, to sum up uh, the essential points uh, that uh, we wanted to leave it to them in terms of uh, clinical messages? Well, I think there are many take home messages today. We know a lot and we'll have much more science in the future, but we know today that type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease are very closely linked. We know, and we've seen it here and also from science, that NIAS combined with IVUS has been shown to identify patients and plaques at risk of MACE with a more comprehensive assessment of the coronary disease burden.
Several studies by now have demonstrated that modern glucose lowering drugs in uh, actually reduce maize in patients with type 2 diabetes and guidelines have been changed. Now, GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGLT2s are recommended in patients who are at risk of cardiovascular disease or who have documented cardiovascular disease. But what we also know is that they're not used widely enough. That can have many causes, but I actually see NIAS and IBUS as effective and useful tools to guide the treatment of acute disease. And they may actually be very, very helpful when we sit in front of a patient in respect to patient education, but also to the patient care team following a catheterization as you just showed us here. So I really see this tool as very, very interesting. Thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, this uh, interesting clinical case.